when the Durham report was released last month, Devin Nunez, former House Intel Committee chairman, and the man who was widely ridiculed and dismissed by the D.C. press corps and the Democrat Socialist Party for whom they work, turned out to be right. Turned out to have the gist of the Russian collusion fraud perfectly and specifically sussed out. Here's what he said upon the release of that Durham report last month. Damning report as it was, but... Because what it represents is the total collapse of the justice system. A lot of people see this as, oh, FBI, intelligence agencies. No, no, no. This represents the entire collapse of the justice system. And it really, the Durham report, reads like the tombstone for the justice system. And it would say something simple, like... Here lies the justice system, the Justice Department, and we knew there was criminality and we couldn't do anything about it. That's really what the Durham report says. There's a lot of great information in there, but nothing's been done. Yeah, that's a pretty good summation. Uh, And I think frustrations uh, were boiling with Durham and it led to his appearance before the House Judiciary Committee yesterday. And this exchange between him and Florida Congressman Matt Gates about exactly what Nunez said. A lot of good information, a damning report documenting the bad actors and their, some of their bad actions. But where is the accountability? One plea bargain for a FBI official and lawyer who uh, doctored an email to be used to get a improper surveillance warrant from the FISA court to for the FBI to surveil Carter Page. That's it. So how do you call that a reckoning? How about this fact, Mr. Durham? The entire Mueller team does a hard reset on their Apple phone in synchronization to wipe away evidence. Did you investigate that? I've read that. Well, why didn't, did you investigate it? Who gave the order on the Mueller team to, to wipe the phones. Yeah, that was not something that we were um, asked to look at, and we well, didn't no, look at No, that's not true, Mr. Durham. That is not true, because I'm holding the document that authorizes your activity, and it specifically says the investigation of Special Counsel Robert Mueller. It's in par- Mr. Chairman, I seek unanimous consent to enter into the record the order that says that you're supposed to inter- investigate these things. And so, like, whether it's the Mueller team, Mifsud, how about Azra Turk? Azra Turk, what's Azra Turk's real name? Do you know that? I'm not going to be disclosing the names of FBI personnel that are oh, otherwise unavailable. But, but an FBI, so the FBI sends somebody to go honeypot George Papadopoulos. Who gave the order to do that? I think that's beyond the scope of what's in the report. It's literally the scope of what your charging order is. Who put it in motion? We get after it was put in motion, the FBI did a bunch of wrong and corrupt things. Totally understand we're trying to deal with that. But when you are part of the cover-up, Mr. Durham, Mm. then it makes our job harder. Yeah, well, if that's your thought, I mean, there's no way of dissuading you from that. I can tell you that it's offensive and that the people who worked on this investigation have spent their lives trying to protect the people in this country and pursue within the law you went what it is that we, two, can, we are authorized Trump, to do. On. You tried two cases, lost both of them, and then the one plea, guilty plea you got, Kleinsmith, Kleinsmith is back to practicing law in Washington, D.C. today. Yeah, that's beyond my control. Right, but, but the, f- the fact that you allowed that plea to occur, yeah. right, and, and then the punishment was insufficient, the fact that you didn't, you didn't charge Andrew McCabe, you didn't convict the lying Democrats or the lying Russians, you didn't investigate Mifsud or the Mueller probe, even though, as we sit here today in black letter, that was your charge. And, and it, just seem, it just seems so facially obvious that it's not what's in your report that's telling, it's the omission. It's the lack of work you did. Couldn't find Joseph Mifsud, FBI asset, who set, tried to set up George Papadopoulos, did actually set this whole thing in motion in large measure didn't Jim Comey is uh, writing novels giving speeches and talks about his novels doing uh, star turns on CNN and MSNBC 
Andy McCabe is a paid contributor at the Cable News Networks. Peter Strzok's over at Georgetown. James Baker uh, parachuted out to Twitter before Elon Musk took over and fired him. So where's the reckoning is what Matt Gates is asking. It's a great question. And the question is not so much is John Durham part of the cover-up. I don't think he's part of any cover-up. Well, who got to him? But And I don't know that anybody got to him. I think the question is did you stop – did you only want to go so far because you made the determination? You believed that we could come up with the information, wherever the facts led, and issue a report that's damning. But it's really a political question. And so you're not going to go headhunting the way that U.S. attorneys usually do, by the way, for the heads of agencies like the FBI. You're just going to produce a political document that outlines a political operation that subordinated the law enforcement responsibilities of FBI during the Trump years and let the people decide. That may have been an important question to put to John Durham, but it wasn't put to him. For more on this, please be joined by George Perry, former federal and state prosecutor, regular contributor to the American Spectator. He blogs at knowledgeisgood.net. George, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Nice to be with you. What about that exchange between uh, Gates and Durham and the underlying point? Comey, McCabe, Priestap, Baker, Strzok. It's a damning report and very little in terms of consequences. Well, I side with uh, Matt Gates. Uh, I wrote an article about the subject. Uh, for the American Spectator when the Durham report came out. In the report, there are these footnotes where Durham says, uh, FBI Director James Comey declined to be interviewed. Right. Uh, same for Deputy Director uh, Andrew McCabe and Peter Strzok, head of counterintelligence. They all declined to be interviewed. Um and my question was, and it remains, okay, you've got a grand jury. Why didn't you subpoena these people to appear before the grand jury and testify? And if they still didn't want to testify, you would have the option then of obtaining an order from a court compelling them to testify. And Gates touched on that, and I thought Gates's. Gates's argument that he was making was actually well-founded, uh, but I wish that Gates or somebody would have just put it right to Durham. Why didn't you subpoena these people who didn't want to cooperate with your investigation? Well, and again, as a, as a, as a, as a federal prosecutor, so uh, you know who the wrongdoers are, or at least at some point, during the investigation, you came to understand who the shot callers were who perpetrated yeah. the these at, at minimum breaches of professional responsibility. And so 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 you're putting your prosecutor hat on. Why wouldn't a prosecutor in that position want to whistle those individuals before a grand jury to see if there was criminality he could make out per their testimony? Well, if you thought you had a viable case that would stand on its own uh, against, say, Comey, then you might not want to call him before the grand jury uh, because in order to compel his testimony, he would have to be given use immunity, and that could complicate a prosecution. It wouldn't eliminate the possibility of a prosecution, but it could complicate it. By the same token... If you're getting ready to, to charge someone, routinely a prosecutor will offer that individual the opportunity of appearing before the grand jury to explain himself. And, of course, anybody with competent counsel always turns down that invitation. Right. So that's the only possible situation I could see where you wouldn't want a guy like Comey before the grand jury. 
Did, did you get this? Do you get the sense that that Comey was ever actually a target of Durham's? I well, I got the sense going all the way back to when the criminal charges were being brought against people outside the FBI. They charged Igor Danchenko, who was a source. If you remember that case, he was one of the people that provided information to the FBI, and that case was was put together claiming that, well, Danchenko tried to put one over on the FBI, therefore he's a bad guy. No, I always thought Danchenko was just playing right along with the program at the FBI. Right. They were, they were there trying to put, put a case together to smear the president, to take him down. They knew that there wasn't anything to these charges. They knew that Trump had included with the Russians. They knew that from day one. They knew, based on CIA information provided by John Brennan, that the director of the CIA, that this was a Clinton campaign dirty trick. And they were just furthering that campaign dirty trick. So, no, I, 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 I thought that... Uh, you know, the Danchenko indictment to me was alarming. And, and look at the other indictment, Sussman, Michael Sussman, an outside lawyer. So I never saw a serious effort to go after the people inside the FBI, inside the Department of Justice. This Kleinsmith kid who who doctored this, this, uh, this CIA information to to facilitate the illegal electronic surveillance in the case. Um, okay, he was, he was a guy, he was an FBI lawyer, so fine, they went after him, but what did they go after him for? You know, some throwaway charge where he pled guilty, and as Gates pointed out, he's back to practicing law. Um, so, yeah, I never got the sense that there was a serious effort here to really go after the people in the FBI and in the Justice Department to take them down. And at the time that was going on, I was wondering, well, maybe Durham thinks that by taking that approach, he will be able to get some scalps uh, by playing nice with the FBI. But uh, overall, I just thought, uh, look, I was looking forward to yesterday's testimony. Yeah. Because I thought there there has to be a good explanation for this. I didn't hear it. What I heard was, well, here's what we did. Okay, fine. We all know that. We read the report. I wanted to know, why didn't you bring Comey, McCabe, Strzok, all those people before the grand jury and ring them out? And nobody really asked the question. Gates came close. At one point, he said, what about Bill Priestap? You, and he's, I think he basically said you could have subpoenaed him, but then Gates kept talking. He got into Mifted, who was really the source, one of the primary sources of the dirty trick. Yeah. Um, but anyhow. Well, wait, let's talk about that dirty trick with the information that was not given to agents working the Crossfire Hurricane case. Well, with, are you talking about Mifted? I mean, Mifted was an FBI asset who fed the information to George Papadopoulos that the Russians supposedly had dirt on Hillary Clinton. And then, how about this? Right after Misfit feeds that information to Papadopoulos, Papadopoulos gets invited to a wine bar in London to have a few drinks with this Australian diplomat. And this guy starts saying, well, tell us all about the dirt that you guys have that the that the Trump people have on Hillary Clinton from the Russians. And Papadopoulos goes, what are you talking about? Next thing Papadopoulos knows, he's getting charged. Right. This is the honeypot play right. that, that uh, Gates was referring to with Mitch. Yeah. But, 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 the, but the issue, the, the issue in this exchange, this came out in exchange with Jim Jordan, the issue of not informing field agents, the agents on writing point on Crossfire Hurricane, the, meaning the superiors yeah. not informing them, was that they knew this was a political document from a rival campaign and the agents doing the casework didn't know that. And Durham recounts that his 
telling one of the agents in charge that that was the case led him to leave the room. He was visibly upset, leave the room. He had to collect himself and come back in. They didn't know. But the, the, and so that's all well and good, but that would prompt the question, okay, John, well, if that's the case and they were put in the dark by people above them, then how do you know go above people? How do you not go to the people above them and start asking questions about why did you do this and what were your motives and who else was informing the decisions you were making? Yeah, yeah. Look, I'm always reluctant to criticize the guy who was in the trenches doing the investigation and uh, trying the case. Uh, you know, they, they deal with, with problems and issues that, you know, we just don't know about. But I'm not seeing anything, absolutely nothing, that would excuse not bringing McCabe and Strzok and Comey before the grand jury and the question you just posed, why was this information withheld from the field agents? First of all, why was this thing being run out of the Washington field office when it was a wide net that you could have gone elsewhere with it? Uh, and why? And yeah, why did why were the field agents kept in the dark? Why was there a close grip on the relevant information? Maybe uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, David Weiss over there in Delaware will appoint. Uh, John D Durham to uh, do the rest of the Hunter Biden investigation to make sure that gets wrapped up too. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Well, David Weiss' uh, job is safe for now because uh, you talk about taking a dive. Uh, he's he is for your listeners. He is the guy who came up with this sweetheart deal for Hunter Biden on his tax charges and uh, his illegal purchase of a firearm um yeah david weiss is a real two-fisted go-getter prosecutor um and i'm being sarcastic for anybody who can't spot that mm -hmm. um yeah yeah i mean we talk about timing uh the 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 weiss weiss puts out a statement on tuesday um announcing the charges and and he says one of the charges is uh, that Hunter Biden illegally possessed a firearm for five days. And uh, he's trying to make it sound like, well, it was only for five days. Well, it's a felony. Yeah, and but the, the cover-up was worse lying, than the lying, Sorry, yeah, Sarah, lying I mean, he, on, paints, he wanted somebody to dump it, so then he had this girlfriend go back to the garbage can on the playground where he had it. And they, she couldn't find yeah. it. And the Secret Service picked it up. But he wasn't vice president at the time. So why do you, he still have Secret Service <laughs> protection? I don't get it. Yeah, well, look. Why, if, look, if I was the prosecutor and I was going to charge Hunter Biden with, uh, first of all, not paying his taxes, and number two, with this gun violation, which, by the way, the gun charge arises out of a, a false answer on the form you have to fill out when right. you purchase a firearm. Right. If I was that prosecutor, my task would be simple. If I've got the goods on those cases, I'm just going to put it, put the charges on the table and say, okay, Hunter, here are the charges. The deal is this. You plead open to these charges, and then we'll see what the court does with it. Right. But that's not what we have here. We have this, from my standpoint, this unbelievably sweet deal sweet. for Hunter Biden. Right. Where, well, he should be charged with reckless I mean, handling of a weapon. Well, for, for, why don't you go to Hunter yeah. Biden and, for starters and say, and, I mean, especially after five years, this should happen in the first five days of investigation. Say, OK, um, we're going to yeah. charge you with felonies across the board here unless you want to start talking mm -hmm. about uh, your foreign dealings and the big guy. So start talking. You yeah. want you don't want to no, talk? OK, good. fine. Then. And we're going to move forward with this case, and then we're going to continue to investigate that. So you're not going to be done after you plead out here or after this case is adjudicated, whether you plead or whether we go to trial. How about that? Yeah. Well, look, I mean, the, the, the tax charges are based on receiving taxable income in excess of $1.5 million for 2017 and again in 2018. Right. Where did that money come from? What's the source of that income? The only hopeful thing I heard out of Weiss's office was that the investigation is continuing. But 
given the, the charges that he's brought and the disposition of those charges, I'm not holding my breath that this guy is going to be able to advance the ball any further. George Perry, former federal and state prosecutor, regular contributor to the American Spectator, and he blogs at knowledgeisgood.net. George, thanks as always. Okay. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. There's only one radio show in Chicago talking about today's biggest stories and telling you what they really mean. That show is this one. Chicago's Morning Answer on AM560, The Answer. Hey, everybody. Charlie Kirk here. Freedom Square is an unbelievable service designed to unite freedom-loving Americans. I know these guys. They love their country, and they're doing an amazing job. You can log on now to create your free personalized dashboard. All of your favorite news sites, podcasters, all on one site, all at your fingertips. Sign up your business right now at freedomsquare.com and start connecting with freedom.